Okay, thanks, Rachel. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things this afternoon. Whoa, a bit further away from the mic. Uh, so the first is just a discussion of all the things, all the great things that Conservation Halton is doing with respect to species at risk, uh, our contribution to recovery teams, implementation of recovery act actions, and also our role in municipal plan review. The second part of my talk specifically addresses some of the challenges associ associated with the current ESA, as well as some of the proposed uh, changes that Joe's already mentioned. So Conservation Halton is, of course, one of the 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. We're probably one of the smaller ones at about 1,000 square kilometers, and we're located, uh, does this have a pointer? Oh, it is. Uh, so we're at the far western end of Lake Ontario. Um, and although I'll be speaking from a Conservation Halton perspective, a lot of the, uh, the ideas that I'll be bringing forward can be extrapolated to other conservation authorities across the province. So as I mentioned, we've been contributing to the work of recovery teams for over a decade now. And currently we have staff on three recovery teams, the Jefferson Salamander, Eastern Flowering Dogwood, and Red Side Days recovery teams. And again, there are a number of other conservation authorities across the province who are participating on, on many different species teams. We own and manage over 4,000 hectares of, pro of property that provides habitat for quite a few different species at risk. And we also have a private landowner stewardship program. We've been fortunate in receiving assistance from the Species at Risk Stewardship Fund for the past several years, and I think we really have a lot to show for it. Um, so for example, in the past five years, we've updated over 3,000 species occurrence records and used this information to help inform our management decisions. Uh, we're doing health assessments for butternut, eastern flowering dogwood, American chestnut, um, and we also monitor the Jefferson salamander breeding ponds in water down where the annual road closure occurs, and we, we advise the city on when that, uh, when that closure should occur each year. So the timing of the Species at Risk Fund was actually ideal for us because it came along just as we were updating master plans for a number of our conservation areas, like Hilton Falls. Um, and if you have a look at, this is sort of the before image, uh, before we started undertaking these really um, uh, an increased intensity of species at risk updates. So these are the species at risk that we knew about before, and this is what we know about now. So obviously this information was quite directly relevant to the master planning process and developing zoning that would be protective of the areas that have species at risk. And we also learned a lot about where our trails are and where they should and should not be in the process. Uh-oh. There we go. So once we had a better handle on where our species at risk actually were and how many there were, it allowed us to make some specific management recommendations to protect them. Uh, the picture that you see on the far right here is a, a small boardwalk and an observation platform that we built overlooking a Jefferson salamander breeding pool where we had been experiencing uh, hikers and dogs going off trail and splashing around in it. So we built this boardwalk uh, to try to contain them and we also installed some educational signage just explaining why the boardwalk was there and encouraging people to stay on trail. Uh, this other picture is, is one of our private landowner stewardship uh, projects. So these horses are in a wetland that's directly adjacent to a red side day stream. Uh, so obviously it was a pretty high priority to fence the horses out of the wetland. We um, arranged for an alternative watering source for them. And we also made some improvements to channel morphology. Now as a, a complement to our habitat restoration work, uh, we've also taken the opportunity to do some educational outreach. And just as, as two quick examples, um, we've installed a number of these signs around the watershed, dealing with different species at risk in, a, in an appropriate context. And this picture shows uh, one of our volunteers. We coordinated a volunteer monitoring program for chimney swifts. OK, that's the end of the visual stimulation, unfortunately, because we're going to talk about planning for a bit. Um, so Conservation Halton is directly involved in municipal plan review, as many other conservation authorities across the province are. And traditionally, the approval for Planning Act applications has been municipal affairs and housing, but delegation for approval of many of these applications has been delegated down to municipalities in many cases. Um, it's, it's not the same across the board. It depends on what type of planning application, and also it's, it varies by municipality. So in Halton Region, as an example, municipal affairs and housing uh, is still the approval authority for official plans, but everything else, like official plan amendments, subdivision con consents, those uh, approval authorities have all been delegated down to the municipality. So really, it's only, um, 
it's only the official plans that are, that are going through the one window process that you hear people talk about a lot, where different ministries are circulated, including MNR. Everything else, uh, the decisions are made at the local level. MNR can become involved if, if their uh, response is requested, but um, as a matter of general practices, they're not circulated on, on these sort of lower level, more detailed planning applications. One other note is just that official plan land use designations, there's, I think there's a misconception out there that um, we actually know where everything is and we absolutely don't. The, the, the land use designations and official plans are made based on the best available information at the time, but our knowledge of where these species are is, is far from complete. And that's why we have increasingly detailed field studies that occur at each successive stage of the planning process. Now, Conservation Halton has uh, memorandums of understanding with our municipal partners to assist them with the technical review of these planning applications, and this includes matters pertaining to endangered and threatened species. So, of course, the endangered and threatened species policies of the PPS are, are separate from the ESA, um, so we also try to refer pro proponents to the ESA for consultation if we encounter species at risk in our reviews. So one challenge that I deal with on a daily basis is just, and you've heard this several times already, is just the lack of integration of the ESA with the existing land use planning regime. Um, I think Joe described the frustration pretty well. Um, it's just being viewed as one more obstacle to development. There's overlapping approvals, and it can be a very long and confusing process to get a permit. But I think the biggest source of conflict really comes because um, the permit comes at the end of the planning process. when. Proponents have already invested a significant amount of resources in, uh, in getting these plans approved. So is it the act or the implementation? I think I, well, I don't think. I definitely share Commissioner Miller's comments this morning that it is the implementation. So I have a few comments on that. Uh, so some of the, the changes that are proposed to the ESA involve moving from a per permit application process to establishing rules and regulation. And I, I do have a number of concerns with that approach. First, there are references to planned activities and completed environmental studies that I think would be really problematic to actually implement. Planned activities aren't tied to any identifiable specific um, point in the approvals process, uh, and I, I, I just don't see how this would provide any certainty in terms of knowing which projects would qualify and at what point they would qualify. The reference to completed environmental studies is concerning because we see a lot of variation in the quality of initial submissions. Some, some submissions are good to go right off the bat, and other submissions that have been technically completed still need a lot of additional, additional work and back and forth to get them up to uh, a standard where they would ever be considered for approvals. So if this is the route that MNR chooses, um, I think both of these words and quotations really need to be approved um, activities and approved environmental studies. It's not uncommon, of course, to have more than one species at risk on a site, and sometimes their habitat requirements can conflict. Now, these projects would have to be, really have to be processed as a permit as opposed to uh, using rules and regulations because you need to balance the needs of all species and you need a real live human being actually looking at the site to be able to do that. Um, and just as an example, I was on the Asable River Recovery Team a number of years ago, and the, that plan addressed the needs of, uh, a number, it was an ecosystem approach that assessed the needs of fish, reptiles, and mussels. Um, I was on the team as the reptile person, and there were various other species experts, but uh, the problem was that my turtles were eating the mussel experts' mussels. So <laughs> it, uh, it, it made for some interesting discussions, but it just highlights the importance of, of uh, keeping the human factor in this and having someone looking at things from a holistic perspective. In terms of the requirements of other regulatory agencies, it may not even be possible to come up with a standard set of rules that would be compatible with everyone's requirements. So for example, there may be something proposed for a red side day stream that would be great for the fish, but if it's gonna increase erosion or flooding potential downstream, you're not gonna get a permit from the Conservation Authority anyway. A lot of B the BMPs um, for aquatic species that I've seen in the EBR posting have actually already been required under, under other legislation for a number of years, um, and yet we still have an ever-growing list of species at risk, and many of those that we have um, have been uplifted from threatened to endangered. So again, uh, a site-specific permitting process would let you really tailor those overall benefit conditions to something that actually may be, result in, in a, something better off. 
And finally, I have concerns um, that MNR has actually sufficient capacity to monitor a registry-based approval system. And if that's the case, then I just don't see any incentive for, for proponents to actually use it if the monitoring and enforcement side of things uh, is inadequate. I also have some, uh, some specific concerns about the, the transition provisions because the language used in the EBR posting refers to minimizing adverse impacts as opposed to overall benefit, and those are two very, very different thresholds. Overall benefit is really a key pillar of the Act, and of all the, of all the other approvals out there, nothing else addresses this need. There's a reference to the 65 transition species that were listed as endangered and threatened as of 2007, but they weren't regulated under the old ESA. Uh, at the time, and habitat protection for these 65 species was put on hold for five years. And in reading um, the EBR posting, it sounds like that transition period is in, in danger of being extended even longer. There were also a number of industries in 2008 that were given the option of negotiating agreements that would exempt them from the overall benefit provisions of the Act. And again, it sounds as though those exemptions may, uh, may continue. I think the, the net result of, of all these uh, proposed changes is that you would end up with a really convoluted regulatory framework um, that'll be even more complicated to work through than it already is. So, oh, okay. Uh, so this is the current situation, and this is actually not a hypothetical site. I'm dealing with a site right now that has all of these species plus two others. So this landowner, just as it stands right now with, with, with the existing regulation, is on the hook for producing three separate reports and submitting an overall benefit permit. And I just don't see how this is streamlining at all for either the proponent or for MNR. Okay, enough complaining. Um, so there are a number of options out there that I think would result in a simplified and faster review process without increasing the risk to species that are already in danger of disappearing from the province. The first is delegation of approval authority for sea permits to the districts. This is one of the recommendations from the ESA panels report, and I'm really not sure why it, uh, why it hasn't already happened. I agree there has to be some way of dealing with situations that come up right at the end of the planning process, but it should be done through the permitting process and instead of rules and regulation. If avoidance or mitigation is just not going to happen, then proponents can do off-site compensation. The key here, though, is that it has to achieve overall benefit. The development of BMPs is, is really a natural outcome as the ministry gains experience with the legislation, but again, it should be implemented through the permitting process instead of deregulation. And this is an area where I really think that recovery teams are being underutilized. Finally, it needs to be recognized that MNR can't do this alone, and it's not working to have the ESA process operating in a totally separate silo from the rest of the land use planning framework. There may be opportunities to delegate some approval authorities uh, to the conservation authorities, similar to DFO's fish habitat referral process. So YCAs, uh, well, first of all, we operate within smaller jurisdictions and we just have more staff, which translates to a faster turnaround time. We're already involved in land use planning all, all the way from the macro official plan scale all the way down through subdivisions and site plans. Um, and this type of integration would probably help to reduce the number of those unpleasant surprises that come right at the end of the planning process at the ESA uh, approval stage. We do try to be integrated as much as we can now, but it would reduce the amount of back and forth if we actually had the authority to make some calls on MNR's behalf and sort of sign off on the easier ones. So as an example, if we issue a, a, conservation, a conservation authority permit, we try to make sure that MNR will be happy with it as well because it doesn't do, doesn't do the proponent any good if we approve a permit that MNR changes that we then have to reissue and it causes more work for us as well. Conservation authorities have in-house expertise related to species at risk. As I've already mentioned, we, um, we participate in research and recovery teams. We've all done our, NH well, not all, but we've done our NHIC data sensitivity training, and we know our watersheds. Another strength of CAs is that we have technical expertise in a number of different areas, like engineering and hydrogeology, that really can be useful in, in problem solving some of these issues. Ultimately, some form of partnership would benefit species at risk because it would allow MNR to focus more on recovery because at the end of the day, that's what counts. And there's some more eye candy for you. <laughs> 